mic check, please. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Ducks Limit Podcast. I'm your host, Chris Jennings. I'm your host, Dr. Mike Brazier. My name is John Gordon. I'll be your host. And I'm your host, Katie Burke. Welcome to the Ducks Unlimited Podcast, the only podcast about all things waterfowl. From hunting insights to science-based discussions about ducks, geese, and issues affecting waterfowl and wetlands conservation in North America, we bring the resource to you, the DU Podcast. everybody, welcome back. We are on location today on the campus of Mississippi State University, the College of Forest Resources. It's my old stomping grounds. I went to school here for a number of years. And I'm, I'm super excited to be joined by two good friends. One that goes, he and I go back, wow, longer than we probably should admit. Dr. Brian Davis here at Mississippi State. Brian, welcome to the podcast. Thank you. And a repeat guest on the podcast, Dr. Phil Lovretsky. Phil, good to have you, man. Happy to be here, finally in person. That's right. I, we are uh, in person, and we had the opportunity to come down and visit with with you. You're here at, on campus to give a presentation here later today. We're going to miss that, but uh, we wanted to come down and talk with you about some other work that we're doing. But this was another opportunity to catch up with you on some of the latest work that you're doing in this really exciting field of of waterfowl genetics if you'd asked me three years ago if i would have ever used those words together i probably wouldn't exciting in genetics you know but it really, <laughs> it really is it really is this is an area some people have and brian i think you even kind of described it as sort of a, a new frontier in some of what we're studying in waterfowl research and and i i would have to agree with that and i think some of what you're you're finding um it certainly corroborates that before we get too far or before we launch kind of into the discussion on some of the latest and greatest work that, that you two have been collaborating on, Brian, I'll get you to introduce yourself to our audience. This is the first time that we've had an opportunity to get you on uh, the Ducks Unlimited podcast. We This will not be the last time we do so. You've been on our radar for quite a while for a number of reasons, but didn't want to do it unless we were in person. So we've got that opportunity now. So introduce yourself to, to our audience. I've been around a while, right? <laughs> so you and I go back a couple of decades. Originally from Missouri, went to the University of Missouri and graduated, spent six years with California Waterfowl Association, and then came here for a master's and PhD, and then worked for DU from 2001 to 2009, and then moved back here in July of 2009. I've been here since. So you know, a little bit around the country, Arkansas, Louisiana, California, Missouri, Mississippi. Your areas of expertise in the waterfowl world, what are some of the things that you've focused on? Basic applied waterfowl ecology and management. We've had some telemetry studies. Of course, wood ducks is a big one. Um, we've got to collaborate on coastal wetlands in, in South Louisiana, which has been fabulous. Currently working on a golden eye project in Alaska, um, working on pollinators and wetlands, and kind of just a little bit of stuff all across the board. Of course, the genetics work now that... The famous Dr. Lovretsky. It's been great. So, You're the person that we're going to connect with eventually for our wood duck species profile. That's yeah. We've had several people reach out to us and ask, when's, when's that one coming? And like, well, it, it's coming. I know who the person's going to be. I know who our guest is going to be, but I want him here in person. We're not going to do that one today. We don't have enough time. We'll get you to Memphis in studio to do that one uh, because, yeah, that's been a big focus of yours throughout your career. And it's good to... We've stayed in touch all these years, and, and it's it's good to be doing this here with you. Glad to have you be part of this. Thank you. And Phil, for those that may be catching you on this episode for the first time, a brief introduction of yourself and your area of expertise and where you are. Yeah, so my name's Philip Lavresky. I run a wildlife genetics lab at University of Texas, El Paso. We study, obviously, our primary system being waterfowl, ducks, geese, swans. But we essentially do anything under the sun that's got DNA and, and a bit of funding. So we we try to answer all sorts of questions uh, for state, federal, private individuals and happy to do so. We had we have had you on four prior episodes where you've you've helped us out. The first 
first time that you visited with the Ducks Unlimited podcast was, I think that was back in 2020 because we did that remote. That was, yeah. that's right. Pandemic. We had to, we had to re-record that one. It yep. was like a two hour conversation. Something happened to the audio. It was you, me, and, and Tom Mormon, and we had to, re- we had to record that. So, Four hours of me talking. I mean, yeah, about genetics. Who would have thought? <laughs> so, but, uh, and, those were episodes, I think, like 140, 139 through 141. And then most recently, like in January of 23 of this year, we connected with you sort of on short order to talk about hybrids. That's another area of sort of interest of yours is trying to explain the genetics behind hybrids and using some advanced techniques to definitively identify the parentage of these of these hybrid birds. And that was on our, the title of that episode was uh, our hybrid waterfowl sterile, and that was episode 465. So I encourage folks to go back and listen to those if you hadn't, haven't. This is sort of the next installment in this story of, it, and it's a it's a story of discovery. I was coming to someone that, and I think this is fair to say, you guys tell me if it's different. And, and most of the things that we do now in waterfowl science, it's rare that we find true discoveries, right? We're, we're, we're understanding in more detail a lot of things that we have understood and figured out over the years and that and, and that and that fine tuning is allowing us to do better with certain aspects of management but it, it's it's relatively rare to find a true legitimate discovery that fundamentally changes the way we start thinking about the birds that we're seeing and managing is that is that fair Brian would you agree with that yeah uh, this is amazing uh, amazing discoveries and it's I don't know how to put it exactly but it's almost like we've done so many of the tangible things like we locate nests you know we watch birds go from habitats a b to c those kind of things but I kind of look at this stuff that Phil does as sort of the invisible like the within that isn't apparent to the eye we've never focused on that we're always interested in how many birds are over here, or over there? Where do birds nest and why? And things like that. So, you know, there's been a lot, obviously a lot of work on food and physiology and things like that. So there's been a lot of work on on the internal uh, mechanisms of birds. But at this level, you know, chromosomes and genes, it's like, hey, maybe this has a lot more uh, emphasis or driver than we ever thought, you know. And, and I, I'm sure we're not there yet. Hopefully not because he'll be out of a job. But I think we're, we're heading that direction. Sort of the intangible things or the unseen things, and and to yeah, me those you, are really you guys. Are, you guys are giving me goosebumps. Um, <laughs> oh, I, was I think I'm, gonna, I'm about to get teary eyed. <laughs> I, was, I was I was gonna ask you, are we being too generous? Uh, yeah. A little bit. <laughs> no, I, no. no this is, I mean, it's taken a lot to get. Not every field, you know, accepts certain aspects and everything. And and I've been working to showcase how genetics can be just as much of a tool as telemetry units or core sampling or habitat assessments or any of those types of things, TME analyses. It's it's just a, a level of information that allows you to then further fine tune and dig into those questions, potentially decreasing biases that you didn't know were there. By I mean, to be to be fair, it's basically creating a foundation where you actually know for for real certain what you're working with. And it's been kind of cool for me to see the the development of of your program because having worked for the Gulf Coast Joint Venture model ducks were a species of concern for us. The hybridization was an issue and so I recall remember whenever you started working with you and other folks started working with Florida, uh, yeah, the, the Florida Fish and Wildlife Commission yep. on study over there, and and I remembered the name. It's where I first heard the name Lavretsky, and Who it the was hell? That, that's right. And little did I know that however many years later we'd be doing multiple of these episodes. But at that time, I was talking to you about this earlier this morning. You had you were dealing with just like a small number of I don't know snips or something of that nature, yep. and so it's just grown astronomically since then. That's getting way down in the in the weeds, but now the Basically, the amount of data that you're working with right now in order to, to, to describe some of the genetic makeup of these individuals, it's like ma- orders of magnitude greater than thousands, what you had. Thousands fold. Yeah, over what you had just, what, 10 years ago. Yeah, even in my own PhD, I, I spent three years collecting the data that you're talking about with model ducks and Mexican ducks and black ducks and others. It took me three years to collect 20 loci. And within 
my fourth year of my PhD, I recapitulated everything uh, into the thousands with these new methods. Of course, I didn't publish. I, I waited to publish, you know, the, the first stuff first to make sure <laughs> that got out. Um, but yeah, what we that you just you, we weren't seeing these types of leaps and bounds in in, in genetics. It, it took computational uh, advancements, sequencing adva- uh, sequencing advancements. All these things had to come about, and that's why in genetics. The lag time was almost a decade for most things. Like you had allozymes, then microsatellites, and then and then Sanger sequencing finally got to the point where you could get like lots of different loci, but you're still dealing with tens to twenties. But that only lasted for almost five years, only even less, when all these new methods of partial genome sequencing, where you get where you can access a great proportion of the genome just in an instant. Um, rather than me spending, you know, a year just collecting 20 for a species in, in like a month at that time, it took me three months, you know, I had 150 samples done. Now we do it in two weeks, you know, one week to two weeks, we can, we do 250 samples. Um, so it's just our capacity has grown to the point where we can really look at population level, ask population level questions that we couldn't do, um, even just yeah, like you said, 10 years ago. And I referenced that we're here to talk about the next chapter in this story. And it's like you're writing these chapters increasingly rapidly, right? Yeah, so, it's, because it's of a lot of the Because of a lot of the things <laughs> that you talked about there. So brief recap of kind of where, what this big picture issue is. And we're going to be talking about uh, the occurrence and what we're learning about the occurrence and frequency of game farm mallard genes in uh, in our mallard populations, let's just kind of say that broadly. There, that that was the big discovery that you made a few years ago is that there are these game farm mallard genes that are making their way into the yep. mallards that we are seeing in various flyways. Uh, give us the kind of th- ten thousand level view of that story and and uh, where we are now. I guess kind of stop short of where we are now because we'll get into that with sort of like the next next thing that y'all have done, but the, the backstory on it. Yeah, the backstory. Four years ago, uh, I was under the same dogmatic principles as, as most everybody else where, you know, we knew about game farm mallards or and other domestic mallards, and but they had no relevance to wild populations. Until I started looking at it, uh, big story was really, I wasn't even looking for it. I was looking at black ducks and mallards and, and voila, that these signatures that didn't make any sense kept coming up. And through additional analyses with known game farms and other, other uh, park ducks, park mallard-like ducks like Kaki Campbell's and uh, Pekin duck and whatever you can think of when you go to a restaurant, um, we identified that that other thing in North America was was due to the the hybridization with game farm mallards and 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 if your audience doesn't know this, game farm mallard is just like all those other mallard things, cold ducks, uh, Pekin ducks, khaki Campbells. They're just bred for a very different purpose. And essentially, what you can consider what a game farm mallard is is a husky of the dog complex. It looks like a wolf, but it ain't a wolf. Um, and so it was specifically bred for hunting, shooting purposes. So we wanted it to still look like a green head and have certain characteristics. But over the last so 400 years, the, the first time this, this ever was noted was by King Charles II, 1650, um, asking his people to go and catch wild mallards so he could propagate and shoot them. So this is where we think the line started. Um, so it hasn't been that old. It's been a lot of time, but these things have been transformed now, you know, cut, cut to three years later, we've learned a lot. In fact, I would say we've learned a decade's worth of knowledge in a very short amount of time. And that's because we're trying to catch up. We're playing catch up right now to understand how bad is it? Yeah. And so you said, how bad is it? But I think what you're basically talking about there, you're kind of getting a little head of us there in terms of sort of the implications of it. But so the first question is, how prevalent is it? I'll use the word prevalent instead of how bad is it. How yep. prevalent is this? Is this situation where we're seeing game farm mallard genes 
a, a hybridization basically yes. between wild mallards and game farm mallards that have been released. And a lot of those releases, most of those releases, at least historically, have been on the Atlantic seaboard. Correct. Associated with some some uh, put and take shooting clubs or something Correct. of that nature. That, and and what are the numbers there? I don't know. If the, yeah. So it, current, currently, and the last time Fish and Wildlife ever did a survey was in uh, 2013. Those numbers were about 250 thousand annually with releases. 210 yeah. releases. 210 being the Atlantic Flyway. My personal guess is a lot more than that. Yeah, and you go back farther in time, and it was what four? It was almost half a million a year. Uh, with almost all of them at that time, as far as the records show, you know, from nineteen about nineteen twenty, nineteen fifty, nineteen late nineteen fifties, it was almost half a million a year, mostly on the Atlantic Flyway. And the assumption all along had been that these birds are not adapted to the wild, so we're going to be releasing those. Those that don't Correct. get shot would die that out or not reproduce or whatever. And so, uh, but your data. It, show something it, if entirely. You didn't, if you didn't survive, you shouldn't be having babies. Yeah. And your <laughs> genetics shouldn't be on the landscape. And if that was the case, I shouldn't find you. That's right. But, but you but you definitely you are. are. So much so <laughs> that to the to the to the extent now that in the Atlantic Flyway, I've heard we think you've gone on, on this gone over this before. If you harvest a mallard in the Atlantic Flyway The current the, rate is two percent chance that it's that it's a wild mallard. So ninety eight percent that it's a hybrid that, that's, that or it's a simply hybrid. A game farm, a feral game farm mallard. And in it, this case, a feral is a game farm that is now in the wild. And that hybridization, it could range from what ninety percent um, game farm genes to what forty percent game farm game farm genes. Has, no, I mean basically anything over ten percent and under ninety percent. We found almost every digit you could imagine. So any if it has from 10% to 90% game farm that's, genes, that's, that's our that's, that's our cutoff right now. We're fine fine tuning that as we gain more data, particularly full genomes to really understand what is wild. Um and once we have right now, that's our that's our cutoff. It's 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 not based on biology yet, but it's it's closely linked. Okay, so that's the question of prevalence. We started in the Atlantic Flyway. There's a, also the question of what, are, and you've you've done some work on this, and we've the the what we'll talk about here in a minute is the next step of that. Where else we're looking, and what have you found? But then the issue is like, are we seeing this move west? Are we seeing these game farm mallards mallard genes move west into the Mississippi Flyway? The answer, short answer, is yes. Yes. There's then the next question that we'll get to a little bit later on, but I'll sort of. I'll tease it now. It's like, well, okay, so what, right? That's that's what that's what some folks would would think. All right, well, it's still a mallard with a green head, and and I can still harvest it, and and okay, so so what's the big deal? Well, some of the other work that ongoing work and some work that y'all have, I don't know if you've had any, have any publications on this yet or not, but you're learning why it's important, uh, potentially important. Now, I would say important, and then others may say, well, what are the practical implications of that? Maybe that's still to be determined. But nevertheless, there are some some implications just beyond the occurrence of that that's phenomenon, right. right? So that kind of leads us to the, to the work that we want to talk about today. And that's where my colleague, Dr. Brian Davis, comes in. He's got deep roots here in Mississippi, in the lower Mississippi Valley. One of the um, one of the premier experts of waterfowl ecology and habitat management in this part of the world. And so I got tons of great ideas up in that noggin, and I've heard a lot of them through my years. And so you began to, wanted to partner with Phil to, to on this issue of prevalence of hybridization between wild and game farm mallards kind of in this neck of the woods. So talk with us about that, Brian. So and we probably stumbled into this by being naive, I would say. <clears throat> so when I first moved back here, um, I partnered with Dr. Diane Outlaw on campus in biological sciences. She's a geneticist. And really what spawned all that was, you know, thinking about climate change and some birds move and some don't. Some move at certain times and some, you know, some come early, some come later. And we've always, and you, even back when you were here, we joked about the Halloween ducks, mm -hmm. you know, mallards that come here in October that... If you think about it, they're really not physiologically compelled to move. Why would you move out of grain rich Dakotas, Canada, whatever in October? It's really not that cold there yet. The the thought was, who are these birds? Why do they come here early? And then you relate it back to hunting. You know, it's like, wow, if these birds have this specific, we use the term site fidelity for wintering birds, if they have this site fidelity here, 
um, then it's really important for us to know where they nest on the breeding grounds to sort of safeguard that stock. You know, if you want to be selfish about birds using a specific region. So you can do that with, you know, and, and think in 2009, 2010, we, don't, we didn't even have the GPS radios that you would need now to sort of look at that annual loop. So we were like, well, what are the genetics of these individuals? So we ended up harvesting birds and it really was areas that I hunted, like Western Missouri, for example, and then here in Mississippi. And we actually even sampled birds um, on this part of the state in the interior foothills and the Mississippi Delta, because actually band recovery suggests that birds that winter on in eastern Mississippi actually have more of a derivation or, derivation or inclination towards the Great Lakes regions, those in the Delta jet back to the prairie. So there was even a little bit of, there may be variation based on band recoveries. So long story short, um, we actually collected the feet and Diana analyzed those. And at the time she did, and Phil can talk about this more later in terms of genetics, but mtDNA, the maternal DNA. And, and what that tells you is, is is the lineage. We know who you are. We know who your mother is. We know your grandmother, and you can go back in time. And so one thing led to another. Uh, and one of the things the data revealed were the old world and new world. And, and to a non-geneticist, I'm like, oh, wow, is this significant? You know, we got birds that we know are European descent, in the new world, being North America, we know um, that, you know, that would make more sense. We should have birds here in North America, but we found two. And I don't remember what that ratio was, but nonetheless, we're like, wow, this is pretty cool stuff. One thing led to another. We never published it. So then we got back to it. Um, it's not that we hadn't been doing it in the meantime, but all these other <laughs> things came about and, you know, you get on other things. But nonetheless... We got the, the the genetics fever back, and and I reached out to Phil, especially watching more of his work get done. And I'm like, hey, man, check this out. You know, this is what we did. This is why we wanted to do it. What do you think? And he's like, well, I've published a lot on this. He's like, it's really not that earth-shattering now. I've, I've covered a lot of the mtDNA. But then Phil says, hey, can you get me some new samples? I'm like, heck, yeah. So long story short, in the world of genetics, um, he can talk about it all day long, but you have this maternal mtDNA, which you have a history on. And then what Phil did that we didn't do 10 years ago. So this data was collected 10 years ago. Phil says, hey, can you get me some new samples? That was two, three winters ago. Anyway, about a 10 year, about a decade old span, which it's is exactly really cool. a decade. Yeah, mm. which is really cool um, because these things can can change quickly. And I said, heck yes. So we got more samples. And then he ran mtDNA to compare, you know, apples and apples across time, but also nuclear. So the nuclear DNA tells us, who are you right now? So he ran that. And he's like, oh, dude, this is really cool. You know? So it, <laughs> we, so the, the, the other work we're going to talk about today, the other genetics project that we have really was kind of unrelated to this. But I think what probably the best way to synthesize this work that we just did and published is sort of like putting another piece in your puzzle. It's like, okay, now Phil knows who the birds are from Western Missouri and mostly Western Mississippi. He's already learning a lot from the Eastern birds and we're kind of moving this way to the West. And now he's got a couple more pieces of the puzzle, like who's who. Mm -hmm. So I think that was really advantageous that we're able to do both um, mtDNA and the nuclear and it, the bottom line is, at the end of the day, there really wasn't any change. You know, it's there. You would over that ten expect, year over that ten year period, right? You might think that there's going to be more game farm genes marching southwestward, but really wasn't the case, right? So, so that was that was advantageous. And then the other project is, it's all kind of related, but it is different. And you know, we'll get into that. We'll, but. we'll get to that. In a, get to that in a minute. Yeah. Phil, can you, like on second grade level for me, mtDNA versus yeah. nuclear DNA? Yeah. MT, MT, is that mitochondrial? Is mitochondrial that? DNA. Okay. Well, so at least got that gives part. It, at least so I remember that. Mom gives it to all her kids. Boys, girls, doesn't matter. You get the same exact copy. Only mom. Dad does not provide anything. Whether that's humans or birds, same situation. Mom gives you the mitochondrial DNA. That's it. So that's the maternal lineage. The problem with mitochondrial DNA is that you don't have dad. And with waterfowl, dad is the wanderer, right? The one that might provide genetic variation from one population to another. 
So oftentimes what we see in waterfowl is that mitochondrial DNA is really structured, meaning the female lineage is really specific. And we would expect that because mom and her female offspring and female grand offspring and so forth might breed in the same exact locations over and over, creating structure. And so people for a long time are like, oh, look at all these ducks. Uh, uh, They're super structured. And then when we come in with our nuclear, we say where we have mom and dad, right? So you get one copy from mom, one copy from dad. All of a sudden, it's not there. And and, And this story kept coming up over and over. And so... Uh, uh, showcasing how important males are, male bias dispersal of moving those genes around in waterfowl. And so basically what that, what that means is there's not as much structuring in the population as you would have concluded using with just only mitochondria. with just mitochondria. Yeah. Okay, I just want to make sure. Yeah, was- yeah. And so uh, with Brian's stuff, so he, they, they collected in 2011, 2012, um, and they had a proportion. And interestingly enough, that proportion is about 70-30. 70% is new world, 30% is old world. New world, old world. New world, world old world. Yeah, so the translation is these, we, we group them into these haplogroups, which is this A and B. They're about half a million years separated. The evolution of the new world was half a million years after the evolution of the new world or old world haplogroup. And that and that is that is almost identical to what we expect when mallards actually colonized North America. Is it too simple for me to say that old world is more game farm? So this is where this story goes. So uh, what Brian's alluding to is for a very long time, people argued and hypothesized why there are old world genes. In, in North America. Because if you went to Europe, all you'd find is old world, whether it's a game farm, whether it's, it's a presumed it, wild, a wild yeah. or whatever. And I'll explain why that's the case. But uh, what, we're, what we finally figured out is that the thousands of samples that we've gotten, all of the A, all those old world A haplotypes group to fi- only 15 Types and they're all found in, in game farm preserves. Ah, I see. And so now we've really identified the source of why they're even here and their game farms. To, to get that, to get back to wh- why a game farm has a haplotype, domestication of, of mallards occurred in China and Europe. And the wild source would have been Eurasian, which carries an a haplotype, and thus all your domestics carry a haplotypes. You were fit. You were fidgeting over here. You got. I was going to simplify. <laughs> Is it fair to say that when you were talking about old world, we're talking basically talking about Europe? Yeah. And it, so within mallards, it's still fair to say that we have two populations, right? A lot of people, the like hunters, would probably say, "Hey, well, there's a population in Montana, mm-hmm. a population in, in Mississippi," but genetically, there's two worldwide populations of mallards, right? One's an old world European, and one is New World North America. Yeah, and only recently at the nuclear level could we distinguish between a, a Eurasian wild and a North American wild. The mitochondrial lineages are so different because of the female phylopatry that you just don't have cross-section. Nuclear had been moved longer between the two groups than, than mitochondrial did. And so nuclear-wise, they're only uh, 1% different, almost like a black duck in a mallard. Um, but at mitochondrial, they're almost 10% different. It's just the, the longevity of those two types of markers and the fact that females don't move across barrier, across landscapes like that. Like or they're, males more, they're more phylopatric. Is correct. Based, that's right. Because yeah. they move. They move. I just want they to clarify. Move. When you yeah, say that, correct. you're talking about they're more phylopatric, phylopatric. going back to that same natal yeah. origin. Breeding yeah, yeah. So origin. Once, yeah. once a female lineage establishes in the prairie potholes, it's probably, you know, in this particular location in the prairie potholes, she and her daughters and her granddaughters potentially are going to keep going back there. Okay. Or a higher rate than a male offspring would. Okay. That was a bit of a detour. Detour. But I'm good at that. We do that sometimes. So <laughs> back to the results from the from the yeah. samples that Brian and his colleagues had collected. You said 70, 70 30, what 70, was it? 30. 70 uh, B, so mm-hmm. New World, 30% A. So, and that's generally what we see 
in the Mississippi Flyway when you take an average? Up and down. Up and down. On average. On average. It's like you take all the birds in the Mississippi, or mallards in the Mississippi yeah, Flyway, when put I them sampled together. in my 19 paper uh, and 20 paper, that was about the same exact average that we got. And the interesting thing is that when we sampled again in 2020, 2021, Exact same thing. It was 70, like 69, 30. 31. Yeah. They're basically the same. Yeah. yeah. It's amazing. Yeah. And so what that tells you though, because that A haplotype is an indicator of hybridization. So it had to have happened. The A haplotype, old world. Old that, world. Yeah. So that means um, female game farm mallards must have come in and introduced that haplotype into the population. So here's the premise. If it happened Recently, we should find lots of hybrids with our nuclear data. If it happened in the past and through uh, back crossing where the offspring, these high, at one point hybrid offspring, uh, interbred with wild and continuously interbred with wild, the nuclear would become wild again. You essentially recapitulated uh, the wild genome again through back crossing. And so when we looked at the 2020, 2021 data set, they were they were ninety three percent of all the samples were wild. We only found one hybrid in Louisiana, three hybrids in Mississippi, uh, Missouri, and Arkansas. Zero hybrids, which is wildly different than uh, many parts of eastern North America. So you gave me that average across the Mississippi Flyway, but what I think you just of seventy thirty seventy thirty at the mitochondrial, right? So yep. remember this. So that means what this suggests is that there was an input into the system in the past. And then something happened when it, those lineages must have back crossed to a wild parental population that their kids are now wild that's, at the nuclear. When we talked about that, that's the fascinating part of this to me because... Again, we want wild mallards, and the scare is, oh, boy, they're coming. You know, they're, mm -hmm. they're coming from the northeast. Mm -hmm. They're going to be here. And really, I think this is correct to say you're the geneticist, but it's almost like it's reversed going back. It's the like opposite happened. of what you would think is Something actually going on. Something happened in the past. In the it, At some point, there was an influx of game farms. It must have seized. If it didn't, I would we would have found early hybrids, you know, some F1s or F2s or something like that. But because there's so few and all of them are way late generation back crosses, whatever the hybrids that we even found were just super late generation. They're like one generation removed from their kids basically being wild. So I think it just clicked with me in my mind because I was trying to catch up. And, and so the, the, the mitochondrial DNA from the mother shows a higher prevalence of that old world haplotype. Correct. But then when you look at the nuclear, which, which incorporates the DNA from the male, Correct. and the males are the ones that are roaming farther, Correct. those males are, what I think you said is that it would be more likely that, or perhaps that one of those females would have, one of the hybrid females would have bred with a truly wild mallard and would have taken the offspring of those. You know, towards wild. Towards wild. Moving. And you would get that from the nuclear Correct. DNA. But the problem is, is that a haplotype is perpetuated for much longer because yeah. mom gives it to everybody. Yeah. And keeps giving And all it. those and females just have that a haplotype. Yeah. So she's going to give it to everybody again and again and again. So it takes a very... A very a much longer time, if ever, that unless that mitochondrial is is detrimental to somehow making them less, uh, they it would just be perpetuated as long as those lineages are there. So the A haplotype gives us a, a, a historical perspective of that it did occur, and the nuclear gives us a contemporary or today's perspective. Okay, after hearing it six times, it finally clicked <laughs> for me, so I'm happy about that. We're going to take a break right now. All right. And we're going to come back. We're going to kind of wrap up this little part of it. And then we're going to talk about sort of the implications, next steps. What are some of the really exciting things that you're, that you're discovering? So hang with us, folks. Welcome back, everyone. We're here with Dr. Brian Davis of Mississippi State University and Dr. Phil Lebretsky of the University of Texas, El Paso. We're on campus at Mississippi State down in Starkville, Mississippi, or Stark Vegas, as some of them refer to it. Right, Brian? Correct. So we, at the, when we took the break, we had, well, I had kind of 
pieced things together finally in my mind of what what I was going on. So let's kind of wrap up. Like, what are the implications of what you discovered with the with the birds from Missouri, Mississippi, Alabama? What's the big take home there? Let me say the simple part, and then he can say the the smarter part. To me, what's fascinating is a lot of this work. And it's like wildlife science in general. A lot of times we see the what, like birds did this, they didn't do that, whatever. But it's more the why, you know, why are these things happening? So in this part of the work, like before you get real excited about some really deep ecological reasons why, it could be a timing thing. Kind of like our discussions earlier about radio marking birds, we're actually marking the birds that got here at a certain time and probably have some fidelity to this region, um, but we didn't capture the birds before we got here. And so we don't really know who those individuals are. So it could be based on the time we collected the birds, uh, it could be that it could be that um, some of the, the old world genes might be more prevalent. We just didn't capture them. But to me, the other, the exciting part and, and kind of keeps us wanting to do more research is, you know, are these birds sort of self-regulated through assorted of mating? And that's basically like individuals, you know, old birds pairing with old birds, things like that. Whether or not that's happening, I don't know, but it's exciting to think that maybe there's some self-regulation in these birds and whether that uh, holds any can of water, I have no idea. I mean, Phil Phil offers his opinions, but to me, that's kind of exciting um, in, in thinking that, hey, we once had game farm genes here, but it seems to be reverting and going back to wild. To me, that is just incredible. Yeah, so, that, I mean that's so the a, whys of that is that's some that's for the for for those of us that that value truly wild mallards. Right. That's a point of optimism, right? Yeah, uh, showing that just just the the mere introduction by itself isn't necess- doesn't necessarily mean it's a sort of unidirectional. Um, right. progression, right? There is an opportunity to recapture those birds or to, for that, that wild signature and perhaps wild traits and, and behaviors. And that, and that kind actually of work back gives it. you the first indication of that, of how negatively selected those traits might be yeah. by, by natural selection. Because if natural select, if, if these birds were equally good at life as a wild bird, their genetics would still be here. Otherwise, but if they're not, the fact that they're not means that there's something that is what we would consider maladaptive about them, that the genetics has something about maladaptive. Now, what Brian alluded to with a sort of mating, we're definitely going to look into that because I'm super interested in it. And, but, but one thing that I, 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 would, I would have to say here that potentially is occurring is that the source for the birds in this region is likely those of the prairie potholes and the Dakotas of the prairie potholes. That there's a break somewhere, though, right? There's a yeah, and and potentially the size of that population is large enough that it could sustain the hybridization because there's so many of the parental population that you know it doesn't take very many generations to basically through backcrossing that you've got wild. Yeah, and that is distinctly different from the Atlantic Flyway that is no longer. There's not enough of that parental wild that would even permit for offspring to have the potential that that next generation is going to be more wild because they don't exist. And that is a distinct feature that I find very interesting, not for this region, because it's sort of surrounded by stories that are completely opposite north of them into the Great Lakes and east of that into the Atlantic Flyway, completely different situations going on. Regionally, And so I guess another way to look at this, if you think about the Northeast, it's the opposite of here. Even though those may be maladaptive individuals, there are just so many of them that they persist. They persist. Well, and there's a continuous supply of them. That's right. And and it's a continuous trickle of individuals of inputting. And we can go definitely into the weeds of of what happened in New Zealand, what's happening in Europe. But but that's the basic, the, the premise here is that we continue, the continuous input is continuously causing um, a decrease in, in wild in certain regions. We might get to the New Zealand and Europe story here <laughs> a little bit later on, but, but like across the Mississippi Flyway, there is an average, there's an average value an that average. you talked about, but that average is not constant across that, that landscape. Talk about what you've learned, and Dr. Mike Schumer has partnered with you on some other work that recently came out speaking about 
I think some of the uh, presence of of these wild game farm mallards in in some states, maybe it was Ohio, if yep. I remember correctly. Yeah, so so talk about what we what, what you're seeing in different parts of the flyway. Yeah. So so if you so again, I have to premise this. If I look at the Atlantic Flyway, it doesn't really matter where I look at. Really, it's like a U.S. Canada kind of like break point of what's occurring. In the Mississippi Flyway, there is a break point of sort of like north of Tennessee and south of Tennessee and what's occurring there. And it's completely wildly different. So like I said, with Brian, when we, when we looked at down here in the lower Mississippi Alluvial Valley, you know, better than 92% of all our samples were wild, right? Genetically wild. In our paper that we, with Mike Schumer that we just published, uh, uh, one location in Ohio, 300 samples, hunter harvested samples, 35% wild. So it's a complete opposite flip uh, between what's what potentially is occurring in Ohio and potentially in the Great Lakes more generally as compared to what's happening here in uh, the lower part of the Mississippi Flyway. And that is what we consider what we would consider meta population dynamics because the, obviously the sources the the sources migrating or moving or breeding in those that, that are that are the sources for those locations have to be d- genetically distinct. Because otherwise, if it wasn't, it should all be the same thing. And you're seeing some of the same type of uh, breakdowns in terms of hybrids and wild and game farm in states like Michigan, other parts of the, yep. of the Great Lakes. Yeah, so we've got uh, preliminary data. Uh, hopefully, we'll be publishing it in a, in a year or so. Uh, a lot, Some of the work with the state agencies there, plus uh, the work we're doing with Ben looking in with, at, at Michigan, um, and the, and to, to my surprise, the Great Lakes kind of look like France. Wow. And, and France in, in, right now. From the perspective uh, of the, the percentage, percentage of, of wild. And it's, and I mean, Michigan's like the worst, I would say. Don't know why. Uh, but, but the only places I can find early hybrids. So like an F1, what an F1, what, what we consider an F1 would be that first generation pairing between a wild and a true game farm that creates an F1. And the only places you should find that is where game farm, game farm males and or females are prevalent enough that they're actually making it into the breeding population. And besides the Great Lakes, I find it in Jersey and I find it in France. Right, and the and what those signatures provide me is that it's a those are the regions where it's continuing every year. Every year, if it didn't happen that breeding season, there should not be they shouldn't exist, right? It'd just be a bunch of like various back crosses or 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 just wild. Um, but the fact is, is that not only are we finding F1s in those locations, but we're also finding simply feral and simply wild and everything in between. So we know that continuous input is having an effect in those, in those regions, in those areas specifically. Let's get to the so what. Why, does, why is this important? Kind of as a, as a backdrop to this, I'll, I'll make the point that Ducks Unlimited has has you know keeps an eye on waterfowl population status and trends in the different regions and breeding stocks and uh, we, we we try to understand with our partners what's going on with those populations what's driving those declines what are the the limitations on those populations some of those have been a bit mysterious for us to try to figure out great lakes uh, mallard population it's in a, a long-term decline eastern mallard certain some parts of that when you partition out that eastern mm-hmm. mallard population you find i think it's the the u.s side of the of the yep. uh, of the population has been in a de- decline maybe a b- bit more stable in canada when you yep. pull out the the canadian mallards and look only at those those are the type of questions that we in ducks unlimited and our partners think about is like what's what's going on there and the work that you're doing allows us to get to what brian was talking about and ask questions of why through a different lens. And you're learning through some of the work that you're doing right now that genetics aren't just something that we, that we, we study and that birds have them and there's, there's no, and it you know, stops there. I mean, genes determine who we are and what we do and what our traits are and what our characteristics are. And you're finding the same thing with mallards. And so then the key question is, 
are which genes are responsible for some of those traits that would position birds to be better or worse at surviving and reproducing? And are those genes associated with, do they differ between, let's just say, game farm mallards and wild mallards, right? Did I frame up that question? Perfect. Okay. So, you guys have been, I think you and, and Mike Schumer and maybe others have, yes. are involved in a, a pretty big study in, uh, in yeah, SF we were, we were, studies. So we tell able, us about that. We were able to secure uh, National Science Foundation money, um, funds uh, through a grant that we that we put together. Um, you know, it took 10 years for, for, for us, for me to explain to NSF why ducks matter by not saying ducks. Um, no, so, so yeah, so we, we got the, these funds, uh, to look at, to, to further understand the implications of when, why generally understand what happens when wild and domestic types interbreed. And this has implications, not just for ducks, but this happens all the time. Pigs, goats, sheep, everything you get, all the, all the fisheries, uh, that have stocking, the ags, uh, uh, plants, that interbreed between wild and domestic and what how what those implications are for wild populations. Um, so obviously we're showcasing uh, the mallard and with it, what we're doing is again, playing thankfully with those funds and others that we've been able to raise playing catch up and to answer the same exact qu- that question. Now we know this is happening at a landscape level. Didn't expect that. Um, what are the implications? Is it does it even matter? And I think that you touched on that you could at least see the association everywhere. You just mentioned population declines are the exact locations where there is a continue. There is an increasing influx of hybrids and fa- simply feral game farms. So that already gives you an indication of something might be happening there. So now what Brian, me, Mike Schumer, and, and, and the many partners we, we put together are trying to understand is what are those differences and how does that translate in the wild? Um, because as I say it, you know, there are many things that we like about animals in a cage and those things rarely, if ever, translate to anything good in the wild. So yeah, so we can definitely go down the rabbit hole of, uh, of, of those traits. Foraging efficiency, right? That's one of the traits. Um, migration behaviors. You're partnering with some with some other folks, uh, very generous partners, and providing access to DNA samples of birds that have have these GPS GSM transmitters on. That's them. right. And so you're getting these behaviors, and so they're providing those DNA samples. So you're going to be able to tell which of those individuals is a pure wild mallard, or uh, which is a, a hybrid or game farm, and then you're going to be able to look at some associations, see if there are differences in those behaviors. Yep between those wild mallards and those game farm and, ha- and the hybrids and wherever those birds fall along that, that gradient. So foraging efficiency, migration, movements, what are these, some of the other... Morpho- key- morphology, general morphology. It, it, it goes towards those traits, but to quantify how, how different is that bill? Do they have different wings? Do they have different uh, tarsies that might change the way they can move, uh, uh, walk or swim? How they fly and all the all of these things. So we're trying to piece all of those uh, 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 pieces of the puzzle together to get a better picture with the underlying foundation of genetics telling us exactly who we're looking at. And that's the biggest difference between this form of study versus previous studies, where you know you just assume, oh, it looks like a mallard must be a mallard. Let's put that in the mallard data set. Um, here, we're not just saying, oh, it's a mallard. We're saying, okay, well, this is a wild mallard. This is a form of hybrid. And then even within the hybrids, we can start to parse out to understand, okay, well, is there some sort of ancestry breakpoint that all of a sudden that bird or that bird's lineage and its kids all of a sudden, be, you know, at least showcase wild traits? Um, and how quickly does does the really bad traits get selected against in the, in the population? Okay, so let's take each of those here briefly, and if you don't mind, I re- this study is still ongoing, so right, and so you're ongoing. still collecting data. Yes. Can you talk about some of what you're finding from a preliminary standpoint? Absolutely. This sort of general trend. So let's talk about the foraging efficiency. Uh, yeah, foraging efficiency. What are you finding with yeah, that? Yeah. So and is Brock- this a, this is a captive, partly captive deal, right? Yeah. So so we so. Brian had a fifty uh, percent uh, uh, of the of that part, and then Mike Schumer did, uh, and Susanna 
his uh, grad student did the other 50% um, at Forbes and Brian did it at Panola. So we had these two different locations to try to see if environment has an effect. Um, and so essentially what we did was we brought in wild birds. We genetically vetted all of them. Not all of them were wild, but so, which was beneficial to us. But you knew uh, that, right? But we knew that because we were going to get a hodgepodge yep. Yep. out there, which, was, which I was actually hoping for because then we could like, yeah, anyways. Uh, and then we went and bought game farm mallards, right? From a couple different breeders. We vetted to make sure that they were all of the same ancestry. Yes, they're all the same thing, no matter what state I look at. Um, and they are all of old world descent. Um, and so we brought them into captivity and we did these various feeding trials to see how well, how efficiently they, they fed and foraged on wild seeds versus, uh, more of what we consider domestic seeds like corn, um, and, and quantify their capacity to eat those, those types of seeds. And this all stemmed from the fact that their bills this gets to the first part where we looked at the bill morphology. And it's not just us. The first indication was our European colleagues. Uh, they published a couple different papers showing that their mallards are turning more goose-like than- Shorter than bills. Shorter, fatter bills. The lamella are getting spaced out further. Lamellae are those, are the, the fine comb-like structures on the bill that yep. the birds filter feed with, allows them to retain the food as they're filtering water and all that from, through the Exactly. Mouth. And so the, the wider that spacing, the, uh, the, wa- the larger the seed has to be for them to actually retain it. So small seeds will just fall out is the idea. And- the other important foods are aquatic invertebrates there you go. too. So, yes. so you need the tight lamellae to water goes out, all the important nutrients in. go in. And if you're just, all you have to do now is pick up a kernel of corn or some seed, why well, have really yeah. tight uh, yeah. lamellae? Think about so the extreme example there would be baleen whale. You know, if they yes. ended up, if they had to change in the, the spacing on their structures that retained they all that krill, they would anything. not be able to right. feed and, and gain those... Uh, t- retain that as efficiently. Right. So then, so our hypothesis in, in this in this part of the study was that, it, well, the bills have changed, you know, through artificial selection, like Brian here just said. We picked for ducks that could move on, on ground faster so they can run over like a chicken and pick up as many seeds as they can because we just threw them into a cage. That's what we were selecting for. Um, and of course you would never expect, you know, you could say like, oh, well, could we really change that? Well, we, we did make a wolf to a chihuahua, so I'm pretty sure we could do this. So our hypothesis would be that they can't filter feed wild seeds, small, tiny seeds would fall out. And, and to be fair, that's, that's what we found essentially. What, what about, uh, what would be next? We wanted to talk about the yeah, so, so essentially when we looked at the bird itself, um, we, we found four unique characteristics. One being the head morphology, like we talked about. Bills are shorter, fatter, more, more, more of a goose bill than an than a actual dabbling duck bill. The next thing we found is that morphometrically, like the size of the tarsus, the size of your wing was no longer in proportion. They're just simply out of proportion, you know? Um, and so what, what happened is that we, in fact, made them runners. Their tarsus is actually longer, so they're run, better runners than our, than our wild mallards, but their wings are short-loaded. So we essentially took a jumbo jet and we put, um, uh, uh, what's it called? A fighter jet on it. But the other part that is interesting, and, and we, we've only, we only have observations on this, is that we made them into a, a, a jet, a fighter jet, but we also got rid of all their fuel. And what I mean by that is that when we were doing these feeding trials and we put wild birds back on Purina Chow, they put on fat. But when we put game farm mallards back on Purina Chow, they didn't. And they, won't put, they, they simply did not put on fat. So physiologically... They are completely different animals. So now what you've got is a bird that is technically flightier because they have these shorter wings, but they've got no fuel. And so what we're, what, we, what we're hypothesizing now, what we're learning is that these birds um, can make short burst distance movements, but unlikely to migrate. That's our hypothesis that we're hoping with some of the telemetry units that, that you mentioned 
uh, um, that we've got out there will help resolve that and and help us test that hypothesis. Or their migration patterns, Correct. behaviors may be different, may be because, materially exactly. different. Yeah. Correct. The other the other interesting aspect of all of this was that when we when we had these birds in captivity. Uh, female mallards will were, were creating nests, not necessarily potentially having a few eggs, but the stress was was probably limiting their ability to 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 uh, manufacture to make eggs. Um, but a game farm mallard would would either have no nest, partial nest, but almost none of their eggs were in the nest. It was essentially a chicken, and you essentially put eggs on the ground and you walk around. Um, and you would know, as Mike mentioned, Mike Schumer was telling us these stories. And, and in fact, I had a tech out there telling me the same things as she was helping out with, with getting this project going, is that you could walk into a pen and you'd know exactly what that was, if it was a wild or a domestic, based on the fact if there were just eggs that morning or not. Wow. So you can go make an omelet, I wow. guess. So we, we, what we've done is we, we turned a, a duck into a chicken. That's incredible. And I think you and I were talking about it last night. It's as though these game farm mallards are more like gall- gallinaceous birds, the, the short <laughs> burst, you know, birds that... that yeah. So, so we're, we're excited about that. I have a master's student right now just getting into it. We're going to do 3D imaging of these, of, of wings, of birds that we know, the genetic origins. In fact, it's gonna, mo- most of them are going to be part, were part of the feeding trials. And we're actually putting them into flight simulators to look at true loading and efficiency of their flight capacity. And, uh, you know, if this works out the way it is in my head, we can like, you know, pretend they're in a storm and see how they do, just like we would with an airplane. Uh, we partnered with some folks at UTEP uh, in our aeronautics group to help out. And they're just like blown away that we're putting, they're like, why are, what is happening here? It really is an incredible time to, uh, yeah, to to be in this conversation, Brian. It it causes me to think back about on on all the studies. I mean, genetics has suddenly become an incredible, incredibly valuable covariate, right, for explaining Correct. any kind of phenomena that you're studying in in these birds. I think back to any number of studies that have been conducted over the years, and you get it's conducted in one location, then you do the analysis, look at your results, and 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 then describe similarities or differences to other locations and other studies. At that time, I don't know if any of us thought that, you know, genetics might have been a potential important covariate. There's going to be landscape effects and all that type of stuff as well, but you're dealing with, I mean, they're potentially, well, they are different birds in some landscapes. I'm, significantly different they are they are again significantly different across everything we look at if you just want to look at baseline genetics as i've said in other podcasts you know american black duck and a mallard one and a half percent game farm mallard and a, and a wild mallard 10 percent different they are 10 times more different from each other than wow. a wild mallard and a black duck is so so the, the, there's those implications but i gotta tell you so rick kaminsky you gave a story i'm gonna give another story uh, I don't know what decade this was, but he told me they used to do feeding trials and they were wanting to, do, it was early form of TME, uh, looking, looking at feeding, feeding of mallards or whatever it is that they were doing. But they, they specifically went to a farm and they bought, they, they bought these, what they thought were mallards and what, you know, mallards a mallard. At that makes, time. This makes you rethink everything, and right? he said he they trashed the whole thing because they were feeding them Purina Chow and they would just have... 30, 40 eggs, and they just keep making eggs as long as you made Purina Chow. And it was biologically irrelevant to a wild mallard. And they, he basically was, so he saw it, but, but it took, you know, until now to really understand like, oh no, these things are very different. There are reasons that they're, they're ecologically, biologically different. Well, and the fact that they're different, game farm versus wild, okay, big deal. But the fact that we have game farm genes intermixed among our wild populations, that's the, that's the different thing. That's right? the different thing. Yeah, yeah. If you just have your game farm mallards restricted to your backyard, your commercial flocks, or whatever it is, yeah, no big deal. But that's not the situation. That, right? that is not the situation. And you, going back to the question of does it really matter? I mean, hopefully, you know, Brian and I and others will, will be able to answer that question, at least scientifically. And I guess all of us would have to have that conversation if it, if it socially matters. But- 
at a at a biological aspect and a management perspective, if you want to go ask that question, you can go ask our fisheries friends and ask them. You know, when you input a bunch of rainbow trout or salmon that you that that you populate into from a cage into you know a tank into the wild, how does that work out for you? Um, and they're going to tell you, well, there's a reason we're still stocking them. Yep, it's one of those questions where you five years ago somebody might have thrown this idea out there and and would have said, nah, I mean, there's we just don't. Somebody would have probably been dismissive or said, Absolutely. nah, that's probably not going to be the case. Some people but are still dismissive. But it's one of those issues where you don't know unless you look. That's right. And it takes someone and, and, and a group of partners and funding entities to take that leap and say, we don't know, but we're going to be willing to invest in the study to take a look. Somebody did that for you. You found something, and now it has literally sort of opened up a new frontier, as you described it last night. And there is the number of questions and linkages to things that are important to population viability and population characteristics and the behaviors and tendencies of these birds that are important to hunters, hypothetically, in terms of migration. Timing, uh, migration, migration, whether timing, they even migrate, mi- migration urbanization, patterns. all That's of right. these things. Yes. We have mallards that are that are presumably thriving in urban environments. Uh, um, there are, are there differences between the birds that we see in urban environments and rural environments? I know you have some partners that are going to be giving you some, you're getting yep, some information yeah. on that, uh, So right? far, preliminary data, yep, there is. Yeah. Uh, the, the If you've got more than 30% game farms, so you're looking at 70% or less wild, uh, your ten, I think you have two times the the tendency to be in urban settings than if you were wild, more rural. Uh, migratory patterns look look the same. Where you're do again, it seems like this, and it's probably linked to this short burst bird with little uh, uh, fuel in them. Uh, their 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 movements are just these short distance migrations, or they're not even migrations. They're just kind of moving about in an urban setting, going back to the park where they were a lot of the times. Very rarely moving long distance like we like we expect mallards to do. Um, again, preliminary. We're still looking into it, but that that's that's what we're finding. And so far, the pieces keep sort of telling us the same story. Uh, which is which is great, and I'm waiting for the ball to drop, but so far it hasn't. So so it's it's it's, and the the nice thing is we've got European counterparts looking at similar trends, and they're finding, and they're a hundred years ahead of us, and their populations aren't doing so great. So yeah. so hopefully we can we can pay attention to what's going on there. Hopefully, yeah. Brian, where does this kind of rank in terms of the things that have gotten you intellectually excited in your career? Uh, you've been around for a while. What's your kind of big picture view on this and, and where it goes? Yeah, it's it's fantastic. I mean, <clears throat> I was thinking your discussions about um, genetics and sort of being foreign to a lot of us, probably the terms, you know, natural selection, survival of the fittest, those are the things that we've always had beaten in our head, you know, and it's not necessarily the the biggest and the fastest that survive, it's the, those that are most adaptable. And to me, it just, um, the underlying sort of the, sort of more of the whys and who these birds are to me, just, it's just a whole fascinating world that, um, that a lot more remains to be discovered, I think. And like you said earlier, you know, we know so much about waterfowl. It's hard nowadays to really get, oh, wow, look at this. Um, it, in, in this to me is, Similar to, and I've, I'm sure you've done podcast on the incubation, incubation in birds. We've always, you know, it's really important, right? If you don't incubate, you don't have. But who would have thunk that, you know, one to two percent difference in temperature can make all the difference in the world? And we've always just kind of dismissed incubation. Oh, it's really important, but you know, the hens they do their job and all is well. And you start doing these experimental studies of some of our colleagues, and it's like, wow, just one to two percent difference. Natural selection, you know, genetics. Um, so to me, it's the the whole genetic realm is one of those things that's sort of been invisible, but yet we're finding out how relevant it is. And um, so as we learn more about the whys, I think maybe we can make more sense about the what, you know, in terms of migration and things like that. So it's exciting. And I think it's important for the, the conservation community, the hunters to know, you um, you know who who are the birds? Where are they? 
what are the implications and 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 those stuffs those things are becoming more and more revealing so and and we've tried to answer the why questions as long as we've been doing research right, but right. we've we've restricted those those inquiries to Patterns. More tangible things, right. physical things like yep. the landscape, the animals that they interact with, the distribution of the wetlands and the grasslands, and all those things are still important. And those are things that we can quantify and study at large scales and incorporate that into where we target our conservation planning and all that type of stuff. But there are other things happening kind of beneath the water, so to speak, that are equally, and in some cases, maybe more important if we've got something going on out there that's where we have some maladaptive traits that are filtering into maladaptive being those that are not not conducive to to the system in which the birds are living and and if if those things are working there through through the population. That's we need to be aware of those, and uh, that that potentially could be explaining some of the things that well, I, it would be explaining some of the things that we see with regard to trajectories. And you know, you know, in maladaptive, maladaptive is relative, right? So I would say, do you buys a golf course? Leave it as a golf course in in New Jersey, and you maintain carrying capacity for that mallard. Change the golf course into a beautiful wetland. You decrease carrying capacity for that mallard. For the mallards that exist for, there now. That exist That's right. Because, now, of, their because of how composition much and, gain yeah. farm in them and, and the translation of gene to you know, morphology and morphology to being able to feed, to move, so forth, right? You're, 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 if you're unable to forage on small, you know, <laughs> small wild seeds and vertebrates, well, it doesn't make much sense then to turn a golf course into a beautiful wetland with those characteristics. It'd be better to just like throw corn out there. Just to be clear, <laughs> Ducks Unlimited is not purchasing a golf course in New Jersey or wherever it was <laughs> that you mentioned. I want to make sure we get that on the record. At least not that I know of. <laughs> um, but but uh, yeah, let's see. I think we've covered a lot of ground here. We could we could continue on in this discussion if we wanted to. I know there's some more exciting things going uh, um, coming in the, in the uh, in the next few months and and years ahead. We'll be reconnecting with you, Phil, on some of those. Uh, oh, we're nice. trying to get a little partnership going, and and that's something that that hunters may be hearing about. Hopefully, we'll be hearing about. That's about as much of a tease as I'm going to give at this point, but uh, later this 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 year. Uh, keep your ears open. Stay tuned to the podcast and, and all other things Ducks Unlimited, and you'll, be, you'll hopefully be seeing uh, how you can engage and help out with some of this work. Before we go, I want to give you guys an opportunity to acknowledge and say thanks to all the other many partners that have helped in this research. So, Phil? This is going to be a long one. <laughs> uh, but yeah, no, I... The first and foremost, I want to thank all the hunters and private landowners that have provided samples all throughout this time. Uh, but then I also want to thank my funding. D, DU has been a great partner, NSF and others. Uh, but then the, the, the collaborations, just like Brian and I all you know, started collaborating, finishing projects, moving things forward. Uh, none of this work would be would be possible if it wasn't for the collaborative nature of all the state federal agencies, both in the U.S. side and, and Canadian side, uh, as well as the university partners, just like Brian, Mike Schumer, uh, uh, Ben Lukanen, um, whom I think Doug, I, Doug, yeah, uh, Doug Osborne out of Arkansas. Those were our main collaborators for some of the uh, telemetry work. Uh, Ariel Fournier. Uh, out of Forbes, great, great uh, uh, access for for those the folks at Panola and 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 Brian's help out there. Um, Tennessee Tech, Tennessee Tech, uh, Brad Cohen, Nick Masto, Tennessee Tech, uh, <laughs> Brad Cohen, Nick Masto. Can't can't forget them uh, uh, as well, and Pro- um, probably some others. I know I put you on the spot yeah, like yeah. that, and so if if you got left out, that's on me. It's. <laughs> it's, it's. I think the the point is, it's a long list. It's a very long list. And you're talking. Uh, obviously, Rick talk- Kaminsky ha- was a big help as well. We we were able to engage with him and and getting some of the earlier samples out of Mississippi, South Carolina, uh, South Carolina DNR providing those samples. Uh, North Carolina. DNR. Don't don't list all the states because you'll be yeah, here. Yeah, state, I mean, federal. You, you, were telling, you were telling me last night that you've got samples for one project or another from from nearly every state. From at this every point, right? Nearly every state 
Uh, yep. And province. Yeah. And, and Mexican state. Yeah. And we've got <laughs> some some DU staff, some DU volunteers have contributed samples. I yes. mean, so there's a lot of interest in this. There's a lot of people. You've you've been very open about you can't do this by yourself. No. You know, it takes it takes financial resources, it takes uh the the in kind support and and you know, I I, I'll, I appreciate you taking the time to help with the communication on this. I know you've been on a number of podcasts. Ramsey Russell had you on a few weeks ago, and and kudos to Ramsey for bringing this story to his listeners as well. It's really important in trying to marshal support for it. So it's 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 really I mean, one of the more exciting the, things. The that, conversation has to continue or else uh, it'll always go back to status quo, and I'm not sure if we, that's where we want to go. At least I don't. Yeah, right. Brian, any acknowledgments from you? Similar, I want to thank uh, Dr. Diane Outlaw here on campus. You know, <clears throat> got, when you when you come to the university, one of the first things you're doing is looking to collaborate with people. We wrote a small research grant, and of course, Rick was was huge and all that too, and thinking about all that. So, but then from there, the list. I mean, he's pretty much covered it. It's this to me at this point in my career, especially just being able to collaborate with a huge group is a lot of fun. Uh, everybody brings different things to the table, and it's just. It's just cool to really do the big picture kind of things to me, you know. So it's been it's been great, and that that's exactly it. Without with, it's not like I have to be knowledgeable of everything. I just need to have the partners, right? I'll bring things to the table, and everybody brings things to the table, and we can actually get stuff done. In our earlier conversations, he would call me and say, "These are our ducks. This is what's going on." Like inside, he's like, "Why is this happening?" You know, and then we start talking about migration and who's who and all that so it's really it's a lot I mean, of fun everybody's got decades of knowledge that not everybody has right and so i can give you a pattern of the genetics and be like i can make up a story but you tell me the history yeah. and and we'll we'll actually come come to a real conclusion and some real implications yeah brian Phil, thanks for your time we'll be connecting with you again multiple times thank you uh thanks for yeah thanks for everything you're doing Absolutely. Thank you. A very special thanks to our guest on today's episode, Dr. Brian Davis here at Mississippi State University and Dr. Phil Lebretsky of the University of Texas, El Paso. We greatly appreciate all they're doing. Uh, We thank our producer, Chris Isaac, for the wonderful work that he does with these episodes and getting them out to you. And to you, the listener, listener, we thank you for your time. We thank you for your support of wetlands and waterfowl conservation. Thank you for listening to this episode of the DU Podcast. Be sure to rate, review, and subscribe to the show. And visit www.ducks.org slash DU podcast for resources based on today's topics, as well as access to more episodes. Opinions expressed by guests do not necessarily reflect those of Ducks Unlimited. Until next time, stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned to the Ducks. Stay tuned to the Ducks.